community and uh, Soho House members. Thank you so much for coming and joining us tonight for our new Better Earth Talk. And thank you, Danielle and Holloway House for hosting us. <laughs> this is a really, really special new location uh, with a wonderful view. Um, we just wanted to say a couple of words before starting. Um, this time we have chosen the topic of sustainability in film because, you know, as we've seen in the recent months, a lot has been happening in Hollywood and, you know, movements and unions have been uniting to speak up and, and demand fairer treatments and wages and security. Uh, the Hollywood workers have been really raising their voices as a collective, showing us again the power of united and collective action. In the same way, Hollywood creatives are also becoming more and more aware of the huge impact that the Hollywood industry has, uh, provokes, represents, um, and many these days are really striving to promote different ways of doing things and promote awareness and effective, durable change. Among those, our wonderful panelists that we'll introduce in a second and a lot of other people that I see here. Well, I can't see very well, but I know that a lot of you are in this field. So thank you all for everything you're doing for this and to, for building this community. Um, Hollywood is not only the epicenter of the global entertainment industry. Hollywood possesses a unique ability to penetrate our collective subconscious uh, through its captivating images and narratives. It serves as a land of imagination and dreaming and where filmmakers and the audiences can project and come together to explore the infinite possibilities of, of human potential. It's a necessary and it's a necessary and very urgent task among humans in all fields and among Hollywood creatives too as direct promoters of collective dreams to rewrite the script of the future of our planet, both on screen and behind the scenes, as we'll see. Um, especially these days, the need to unite for a constructive and peaceful cause has never been greater. So we hope that this new talk will inspire you to become part of or an ally of a renewed and sustainable Hollywood Creative Collective. So thank you, thank you all so much for being here. Um, I'd like to now introduce our host, uh, co-founder of Better Earth Media, and she's the Senior Director of People and Operations at In Defense of Animals and plant-powered ultra-marathon runner, <laughs> Jane Elizabeth, our host for the evening. Oh, thank you, Annalisa. She always introduces me so much better than I could do myself. I'm super grateful and feeling super short because <laughs> she's so nice and tall. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate you spending your Friday night with us. Thank you for joining us tonight and for always showing your support for this growing community in the environmental media space. Before we introduce our speakers, I would like to thank Better Earth Media co-founder Annalisa for producing this amazing event and bringing us together once again for another evening of future-oriented discussions and networking. Let's give Annalisa a round of applause. And a couple of housekeeping reminders. So Soho House is a private club. Photography and videography is not allowed, but you will be able to check out and share our official pictures and videos on our platforms after the event. Huge thanks to Noah for helping us with capturing pictures and videos of the evening this evening. Let's give him a round of applause as well. And Hellway House is kindly offering a 15% discount on food and drinks for the event attendees tonight. We highly recommend try, trying their amazing plant-based options here or downstairs, but please don't leave us. You can try it out downstairs after the panel, right? <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, everybody's going to go downstairs. We're going to lose our audience. What's that? All right. And last but not least, a huge shout out to our sponsors, Lush. Um, Buddha Organics and Owl in a Towel, who provided lovely, in-kind, eco and vegan beauty products for you to try. So you'll notice that Lush 
um, does have one, um, one product that is in plastic um, that is actually returnable. So that is something that they take back um, and reuse. And if you return, they offer a discount for you to do that, to encourage sustainability. And if you have, I believe it's five um, returns, you get a free product. So even though it is plastic, they are choosing to use it sustainably, which is amazing. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce and call on stage our first panelist, Sheila Moravati. Sheila, yes, Sheila is a president and founder of Habitats of Waste, habits. a non habits habits habits, <laughs> habits not habitats. This is yeah, first mistake of the night. I think somebody needs to take a tally because yeah, I'll just pretend that didn't happen. Um, so Habits of Waste, yes, a nonprofit organization focusing on finding solutions to shift habits of waste among mass society, known for many innovative campaigns such as the Cut Out Cutlery Campaign. Sheila spearheaded the ban of plastic straws and cutlery in the city of Malibu and convinced Uber Eats, Postmates, DoorDash, and Grubhub to globally change the default setting in their apps so that no one receives plastic cutlery unless requested. Habits of Waste is running numerous campaigns, among which Lights, Camera, Plastic, to drive change by shifting societal norms, even in film production. So welcome, Sheila. Thank you. Thank you. Next, let's welcome on stage our second panelist, Jess Visconti. Jess is a non-binary actor, artist, and climate justice activist, and Climate Lens Fellow at Good Energy. They hold a BFA in acting from Cal Arts, and, in, and with interdisciplinary MA from Columbia University's Climate School. A Fulbright Scholar who studied the intersection of arts and climate in Berlin, and a fellow at the Research Institute, Jess has also entombed the Congress that has um, extensive experience in grassroots and community organization and campaigns. Jess sees art as a prefigurative praxis to nature community and enact cultural transformation for material liberation. Welcome, Woo! Jess. Woo! Just gonna do that on to the next. And last but not least, our third panelist, Ellie Weinstein. Woo! Come to the stage. Ellie is a queer TV writer, climate storytelling consultant, and activist. She co-founded and is an EP of the Hollywood Climate Summit and its annual programs, the Climate Ambassadors Network, and Writing Climate Pitch Fest. Ellie was recently showcased in The Hollywood Reporter for her role as director of programming for the 2023 event. As a writer, she firmly believes every story is a climate story, which is evident in her previous work on NBC's Law and Order, For the Defense, Netflix's Glamorous, the upcoming AMC's Orphan Black Echoes, and the Web3 video game Wildcard. She has been featured in The Atlantic and Forbes for her climate storytelling efforts in Hollywood. Welcome, Allie. Thank you. I know the stools the are stools quite are the hop up, <laughs> <laughs> especially for shorties like me. <laughs> I think we need stuffed stools next time. Maybe, maybe that would be good. Uh, oh my goodness. Okay. Um, if I start falling back, just don't try to catch me. <laughs> I'll, I'll be okay. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, well, thank you all for being here. We can't wait to share more of what you do with our audience. We'll be traveling from sustainability approaches on set with Sheila, through climate storytelling with Jess, all the way to environmental community building in Hollywood with Allie. So this is gonna be an exciting night. We're so glad you are all here and thank you all to our panelists for being here with us tonight. We cannot wait to hear what you have to say. All right, let's just give them a round of applause right now. All right, Sheila, we're gonna start with you. 
Um, we have been discussing environmental storytelling um, on Better Earth panels before. However, environmental impact in the film industry doesn't need to come from explicitly environmental films. It is also about what you call habits of life. Your campaign, Lights, Camera, Plastic, is about how our daily relationship with plastic is represented. Product placements only seem to increase in popularity. Part of the reason why it works is precisely that it is discreet. It's a form of subliminal messaging with a great impact. What findings inspired you to campaign for removing or swapping plastic products in films? Um, great question. I feel like we've come through so many new laws, so many new ways to like beat the plastic system by coming up with these default settings and I, you know, worked in the state of California for some policy change and I kept thinking I feel like we're swimming upstream. But where can we close the tap? We always talk about that that bathtub that's overflowing with plastic and I realized that so much of um, society is dictated by what we see on film and television, and it gives us a chance to really determine what is and isn't acceptable. So I thought, what if we were to tap into this world that we, you know, this pretend world that we all kind of consume, and six billion people are consuming film and television. So what if we were to take those moments in scripts and screen on screen and swap out the single-use plastic water bottle? Sorry or <laughs> reusables. Um, you know, it always reminds me of that like lawyer scene where there's a pitcher of water with all the glasses, but then suddenly you start noticing nowadays it's like a plastic water bottle or six of them. And where did that come from? And how did that become our new normal or the solo cups and stuff? So really what I tried to do was emulate what happened with smoking. When smoking was removed from film and television, it took a nosedive, like a drastic number of people stopped smoking. And I thought, well, why don't we do the same thing? So Lights, Camera, Plastic is kind of known to be the gateway for uh, climate st storytelling in a bigger way, where we just ask anyone, anyone who's not really ready to change their script necessarily, to just swap out single-use plastic for reusables. And now we're hopefully going to evolve past that and show more behaviors that people can aspire to because it is really an aspirational world that we're tapping into. I love that. That's such a great answer. And and I did notice that we're tapping into. To, and then where can we close that, that tap? And that's, I like that you kind of opened and closed with the same idea. That's fantastic. Um, and it is important because what we see in film is something that we tend to emulate in real life. I mean, that's just how, how it goes, fortunately and unfortunately. Um, so films and the everyday life they depict can impact our real world habits, but can raising consciousness on plastic and pollution in the script also affect the local studio environment? What are your means to influence the habits of everyone on set and what impact have you witnessed from that personally? Well, we've had it, we've been lucky enough to be in some pretty big productions already, and many times, like at this point, we've basically c connected with every single major studio and every single guild in Hollywood. So we have all these people that are like, yeah, we love this idea, this is great, but what about what we're doing behind the scenes? We kind of feel bad because the amount of plastic that's being used behind the scenes is like unbelievably horrible. And I I always say to them like. First of all, we're not talking about perfection. But second of all, what happens on screen is eventually going to start infiltrating society in such a way that what happens behind the scenes gets affected. So I don't want you know, perfection to be the enemy of good enough. And right now, the swap out of one single use plastic item for a reusable can go so far and influence so many people that eventually those people that are sitting behind the behind the set are gonna say, oh, this isn't right. They're seeing it too. They're starting to adopt it too. And again, coming with this background in sociology that I have, it's, um, you know, it's a ripple effect. It's a grassroots movement. And change happens by each of us stepping forward one day at a time, one step at a time. So we, I always joke, we can't put the whole vegan hamburger in our mouth at one time. <laughs> we need to take small bites. And these small bites are, if your production is ready to just swap out the bottle for a plastic water bottle for a reusable, that's good enough. Don't try to solve every problem all at once. 
That's really great advice. Um, like you said, just one thing at a time, one step at a time, one decision at a time is how we make a difference, not trying to do it all at once. That kind of sets us up almost for disappointment if we try to do it all at once, celebrating the, the small steps. And speaking of which, um, it is, like you said, impor important to focus on progress and not perfection um, because we, well, let's face it, none of us are perfect, right? <laughs> we're, we're working towards that, but it's really the, the progress and along the way. Um, you have leaked the news that you are working on a book called The Imperfect Environmentalist, and it's due to come out in April 2024. First off, congratulations. Oh, yes. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> The notion of imperfection resonates a lot with our mission here at Better Earth Media, which is amplifying and promoting anything that is evidently better for the earth of the planet, but without the pressure for it to be perfect. So will you explain the title briefly and tell us just a little bit about what to expect from your upcoming book? Yeah, I felt like I've um, been very lucky to make a lot of change happen, and I never expected to be doing this, but all I know is that there was a few things I did right, and I wanted to share it with everyone, so I started this project called The Imperfect Environmentalist in hopes to inspire other people to do you know, what they can in their neighborhoods and their communities. I've basically shared every single secret I have had um, that brought me to this point, and the idea again is to help people get through climate anxiety that's causing them to inaction essentially. This is a way that you can just know that there's progress doesn't mean everything all at once, just small things, but then they add up and then before you know it, you're going into your city council, you're using your two minutes of public comment to make changes happen. And there's these little things that a lot of people may just not know about yet. And so that's what the purpose of the book is and it's out on Earth Day and I can't wait to share it with all. We can't wait to read it and just con huge congratulations on that and thank you for putting all of the hard work and effort into showing us that each each choice really does make a difference. Thank you to Sheila. All right, and for Jess, <laughs> all right, we're gonna move move on to you. Jess, are you ready? Uh, yeah, yeah. All right, great. Amazing, as long as I don't fall out of my chair, I am ready too. <laughs> That's a big if. Um, as we switch to climate stories and environmental messaging in film and TV, tell us about how you got involved with Good Energy and what are the main goals of the nonprofit organization? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. So I went to art school, and when that was happening, uh, Trump got elected, and I was like, oh, Fascism, don't love that. Um, so I left art school to go work in politics for a little bit and was a congressional campaigner and interned on the Hill and did all that and went, ooh, this is not for me. Like, love that there are people who do policy and law and all this amazing stuff, but that is not my special skill. What can I bring to fights for justice, fights for climate, etc. cetera, um, that's unique? And so then I went back to art school and ended up doing Fulbright uh, work at the intersection of like arts and climate, because it seemed like the biggest problem. And then got an MA at Columbia's climate school and met some folks who work in film and TV doing this kind of stuff. Some of our friends, uh, Elisa Petrasova, is a uh, graduate of Columbia as well, who worked with Good Energy. And I thought, oh, the work you guys are doing is like really inspiring. I feel like it would make real change. Uh, that seems like the perfect fit. It's both artwork, it's a passion, but it's also like real material change, you know, with systems at large in the way that like Sheila, you know, does. So yeah, does that make, make sense? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I love that you said, you know, it's something you're passionate about, something you're good at, and mm -hmm. something that does make a difference. So I mean, that's just the, the perfect intersection there of finding the right fit for you. Totally, totally. Absolutely. So your climate messaging is research-based, which is fantastic, right? It gives us um, that information we need when people come at us with questions, you have research-based answers. Um, and one finding is that people feel they worry more about climate change than the characters in films and shows they watch, which is a stunning fact that seems to speak of an untapped market for climate stories. When you talk to clients and partners, do you present climate change messaging as an obligation for the film industry or as an opportunity? That's question one. And which of the tools you bring to your partners to help them develop climate stories do you find the most helpful and exciting? Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so like, 
Good Energy's mission, basically, to speak a little more. Your first question, and then to segue into this one, is to like raise the frequency and the quality of climate storytelling in film and TV. So like we see from our research that audiences are really, really hungry for climate stories. Like everyone in the audience, all your neighbors, all your friends, it doesn't matter you know, what your political orientation is, you're thinking about climate because it's the biggest problem in the world. And then you see characters on TV and they're living in this fantasy world where climate doesn't seem to exist. So Dorothy Fordenberry, who's a producer, I believe, and creator of uh, The Handmaid's Tale, has this excellent quote uh, that if uh, climate isn't in your story, then that's science fiction. And we don't want all our work to be science fiction. So um, because audiences are hungry and because, um, as Sheila was alluding to, like film and TV is such a powerful tool for shaping behavior, you know, we can talk about smoking secession, we can talk about the use of seat belts or designate, designated drivers, like all of that was pioneered through very intentional film and TV uh, campaigns. And so, you know, we see from our research that about like 0.6%, not 6%, 0.6% of film and TV has any reference to climate. Even tangential words like global warming, et cetera, raise a little bit, but not by much. Uh, so our goal is to raise that to like 50% of all shows uh, and to keep going. And we see hunger from studios like you're talking about, from audiences and from A-listers. If you look at any of the recent big pictures like, like Don't, Go, Don't Look Up, right? Star Studded. Um, in terms of like the tools that are really impactful, uh, we have this lovely thing called the Good Energy Playbook. Um, our founder, Anna Jane Joyner, and our like brilliant team, screenwriters and um, you know Hollywood folks, activists, etc., um, got together with screenwriters and climate scientists and frontline activists to create this resource for all of you. It's completely free and open source, and it has resources that you can use to start telling your own climate stories. And we would love for you to show it with, share it with your colleagues who might be screenwriters, executives, etc. Share it with you know schools, with young artists, etc. To inspire them. So I think that's like maybe the biggest resource we have to offer. And then if you find like a really nitty gritty question, like I want to know how ocean acidification can be a great plot point in a heist movie, we have specialists that we can connect you with. Um, what was that? All of your questions was a second? Yeah, but I'm just enjoying listening yeah. to you explain. So. <laughs> That's incredible. Degree. That's everyone, so yeah. incredible. Well, and what I love is that you you have you know something that everybody can use, right? Um, this this playbook, right? And what is that called again? Good Energy Playbook. It's Good on our website. Energy. Wonderful. So that's something that anybody can use, and then specifically mm -hmm. to the film industry, if there is something specific that they would like your help with, you said that you have specialists who can do that to raise that number from 0.6 to 50%. Um, and th this is mentions of climate change in film, is that correct? Yeah, if you want to. So I also work for Good Energy <laughs> as a climate storytelling consultant. Um, and so it's a multifaceted process and uh, Good Energy has four different levels of incorporating climate into a story. Um, and so you can check that out in the playbook, but you know, it goes from mentions, which is kind of step one, to fully building worlds that are based in climate having climate characters um you know so there's a lot of different entry points and to your first question of you know this idea of obligating creatives to include climate we approach it much more as like people are coming to us because they're excited to include climate in their work and we use that entry point of that excitement to say hey we have all these incredible uh you know fact and data driven uh, knowledge about the climate crisis that we can give you in, in a fun and engaging way and that's only going to enhance your story um, you know we're not trying to come in and change uh, the the creative heart of a story it more so is enhancing those elements with our lived reality which is the climate crisis and uh, you know pushing that forward in in how can we experience the the joy and like the every that every day which also includes romance and death and comedy and all of these things um, because that is what our lived realities are generally um, yeah. Yeah, no, totally. A really good example of this, like, Ali was sort of alluding to the point that we don't want to be, like, prescriptive and say, like, you have to write about climate. Like, you shouldn't just be writing about climate as an obligation because it's the right thing to do. It is. But what's more exciting about it is that it also, like, raises your level of storytelling because you're able to connect with audiences, right, more effectively. You're reflecting their lived experience. You're reflecting, like, for lack of a better word, the zeitgeist of the world. And a movie that does this really, really well to give you a way to imagine this is Parasite. I don't know how many of you saw that Oscar-winning film, incredible, and they have this like 
brilliantly directed, beautiful scene where our heroes are fleeing a flood and trying to get to get back to their home and like save their belongings and this kind of thing. And it's like beautifully directed in terms of cinematography, but it also gets to this like really nitty gritty question of what happens when a low income community is not prepared for changes in climate. Um, and so you're looking at intersections of class and climate justice, but it's not a movie about climate. It's just like an amazing thriller. And by the way, when you raise the stakes by adding that you know, kind of climate context, you win an Oscar. So like, that's the real stuff that we want to help people with, is just exciting climate stories that also functions as like really urgent and needed climate communication. So this could be any genre. Any genre. Any story. Any genre. And you get, and I like that you said that there are multiple entry points because this could be it kind of like inserted into just about anything and it enriches the story, right? Yes, exactly. Right. I like it. Any way to enrich is, is what we're all about. And I mean, we should be doing it, but it's also good for everybody involved. And you may just get some awards, you know, who knows? <laughs> Want to help you. That, that's awards. not why we're doing it, but it could be a, a really good added bonus. We really just want to save the world. I mean, that's, you know, really what we're yeah. all about, right? Um, so we're going to move on to Allie. Um, first off, we want to really thank you for co-founding the Hollywood Climate Summit and yeah. its parallel activities. Let's give, let's give Allie a little yeah. round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> Um, it is an incredible platform for all creatives in Hollywood and beyond who want to make a difference for the future of the earth. If we zoom out from the climate lens, we can focus on the broader picture. Hollywood as a collective of creatives and a powerful industry. Tell us about the origins of the summit, its main goals, and how the goals might have evolved over the years. Um, yeah, so in case any of you aren't familiar with the Hollywood Climate Summit, we are an international conference that brings together uh, grassroots community or sorry, grassroots climate organizations and industry stakeholders to create community around the climate crisis. Um, so we started the Hollywood Climate Summit in May of 2020. Um, we had originally wanted to do it in person and then the pandemic happened. Uh, and so we ended up doing uh, almost like one of the first of its kind digital conferences and produced nine hours of digital uh, content on a Saturday. Um, and we brought together a whole uh, international live stream. Um, and it was really exciting. And we saw that there was, you know, I think for us as co-founders um, and I'll speak for myself that I, um, you know, entering the industry after graduating college, I grew up writing climate stories. Uh, I, I tend to go towards either like grounded sci-fi or queer dramedies, and a lot of those included climate. And, um, you know, as I was looking at the industry at large, I was like, why are none of these other stories, including climate? I think about climate all the time. No one else is talking about it. Um, and then additionally, once I entered the industry, I had this like deep sense of how powerful everyone who is involved in it is and at the time I the time that we started the climate summit I was an assistant I was 24 like I was not someone who you would look at and be like oh she has so much power in Hollywood um, but I understood that even behind the scenes I was making decisions that would affect millions of people and what they watch and I was like why are we not creating a space to to build community power in that way. Um, so I teamed up with my fellow organizers um, and we wanted to create this accessible community building space around this subject um, and have a place for people to come and have these conversations and learn. Um, and so that's kind of where it all started. And so in 2024, it'll be our fifth Hollywood Climate Summit, which is insane. <laughs> um, and, you know, we have grown twofold every single year that we've done the summit, um, both, you know, it, and especially in terms of attendance, both internationally and in person. Um, and so I think, I mean, the root of our goal has continued to stay the same. We are building that community around intersectional climate justice um, and ultimately are trying to bring in as many media stakeholders as possible and get to the root of them integrating that into their own work and the influence that they have globally um, because Hollywood is a global system that is our biggest culture change. Um, uh, you know, place to to create that. And so we want to really be able to continue to influence those companies and those stakeholders to include that intersectional um, activist driven grassroots climate knowledge into the work that they're doing. That That's wonderful. And congratulations. That's, that's just an incredible thing. And, and it shows that our young people 
um, are more capable than they're given credit for, I think, because um, we have young people who are truly making a huge difference and having a huge impact but on the world around us. we need it to be an intergenerational movement. We do. Um, yes. I am talked to by way too many older people being like, oh, you've got this. And I'm like, no, I need you. <laughs> like, this is not just on us. Um, so we also really encourage that at the Climate yes. Summit. Uh, and we actually had a whole fantastic panel this year that was on intergenerational uh, climate communication. Um, so we, that's like one of definitely our um, kind of uh, footholds in the work that we try to do is bringing that intergenerational community together. That's incredible. And that's such a good point because it really is everybody needs to join in. And sometimes I think um, young people feel like they, they can't do, do enough. And But you are very capable. Young people are very capable. Everybody's capable. Um, of doing something and including, you know, all generations is absolutely incredible. And for the first time in a very long time, or the first time ever, we are seeing more generations than ever in the workplace because they have to, because people are working longer in life. Um, that's good news and bad news. The good news is we have more people from different generations working together, and hopefully we'll see that also for um, the good of the, the climate and to really, you know, make an impact for climate change. So thank you for mentioning that, and it's a very important point. Um, so in award ceremonies like the Academy Awards and the Golden Globes, we have seen more attention to inclusion these last years where as climate change or shared challenge seems underemphasized, what would it take to pull the climate crisis to center stage of Hollywood together with social inclusion and other justice related topics? Um, I think, you know, it's a multifaceted approach. <laughs> um, I mean, that kind of the last thing you said is the driving force behind the Hollywood Climate Summit. So we are hoping to be that space that kind of uh, initiates and brings people into including all of that in their movement building um, and the work that they're doing. Um, I mean, in terms of award shows, I think they're only a piece of the puzzle. Um, and, you know, at the summit last year, we got to host it. Um, very gratefully at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences Samuel Goldwyn Theater. Um, and their investment in us in that way was so meaningful. And they had like all of their uh, interns there working the event and they paid, uh, <laughs> which was great. And they had like their entire staff working on it and they were all so inspired by the, you know, the panels that we were hosting and everything that they got to observe. Uh, we did the event, you know, entirely sustainably. So they got to kind of uh, watch how to then reproduce those methods for their own event processes, including the Oscars. Um, and they announced for the first time a sustainability uh, message to the public, which they had never done before at the Hollywood Climate Summit. So, and I've spoken to both, you know, the film and the TV academies, and there's a lot of awareness and wanting to like push forward um, into this movement, but it's all about systems change, right? So, um, you know, it's, it's a gradual process, but there's a lot of excitement behind it. But in terms of like literal award shows, it's like, yes, they should all be produced more sustainably. But additionally to what Jess and Sheila have been saying, it's like, can you be showing on screen um, you know, you could have those incredible comedian hosts do climate comedy. At the summit this year, we partnered with Gen 180's climate comedy cohort, and we had their comedians host the summit and do climate comedy to introduce each panel, and it was very effective. Um, you know, and so how can you kind of like introduce those more fun, joyous moments uh, into something like an award show? Um, and in terms of like the idea, I think of having a uh, like a sustainable film award or, or climate storytelling award um, also to like the work Jess and I do in storytelling. It's more so about that every story needs to be a climate story and how can we just produce more great content that happens to be about climate that then wins awards and then gets more support and press for stories like that rather than like making it specifically the climate story. Um, you want it to be integrated into every great piece of art that we're doing that ideally then if it wins awards only produces more need um, and want you know, in the capitalist system we exist in uh, to continue producing content like that. Um, and so that to me would be what is exciting. But I think, you know, we are not, those things are not being noticed at award shows like that until they're culturally re relevant. And so it's like, how do we make climate stories more culturally relevant to then win awards? Um, so I think that's almost like one of the last stops. Um, and it's ultimately about like building that education and, and relevance in, in all of the storytelling work that we're doing across the whole system. 
that is such a great answer and I like how you got kind of to the root of it <laughs> because you know the change we see certain things on the surface but that's like you were saying just kind of on the surface and if you get to the root of it and start there that's where we really need to see those changes being made so thank you for so, oh, so eloquently sharing that with us um, really appreciate that Ali so um, let's give a round of applause to our panelists we're not done with you yet though <laughs> It just felt like a good time for a round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> um, so this is a question for all of you. Um, so just in one phrase, um, we'll ask you for your opinion on this. So as humans, we seem to be insatiable for stories in all their forms. That's why, like never before, we should leverage this fact and let stories help us shape a better future. In working for climate messaging in film, both in front of and behind the lens, what have you learned about our hunger and need for stories? And what does this tell us about what climate messaging can do? Who would like to start? Sheila, would you like to start? Sure, I mean, it, when you're saying that question, all I can think about is, you know, going back into ancient times when they see the artwork on the walls of like, you know, etched into these stone walls and there's so much of life was depicted of how they, everyone lived back there through these stories that were told. It's just part of our humanity. It's part of our essence. And um, to not mention climate in a meaningful way is just almost like robbing us of this current moment that we're facing. And I think that for me is my phrase is just like it, it is just an evolution of time now it's on a screen but back then the stories were told to parents from their grandparents and the grandkids and on and on and on and we just must continue in that way wonderful i love that love that answer jess yeah mine is a, a two-part question two-part answer um at the hollywood climate summit which ali did such an incredible job organizing all of you should be there next year <laughs> Um, it's such a good time. It's true, it's true. Yeah. Thank uh, you. <laughs> June 24th to 29th, everyone, <laughs> 2024. Mark your calendars, everyone. We'll be there, come hang out. Um, anyway, so at the uh, Hollywood Climate Summit, um, one of the speakers was Daniel Kwan, who you probably all know is one of the directors, uh, Daniels, uh, of Everything Ever All at Once. And Daniel Kwan has this amazing quote that basically goes, um, systems are the fossilized stories of our past and the stories we tell now become systems of our future and like i feel like that's a really profound and powerful way to sum it up like as she was saying like the only way that we really communicate to each other even if it's a math problem even if it's economics and all these heady things is by telling the story about that right um, it's by communicating in a human and like really emotional way right in a way that compels people and speaks to human connection human agency right and so like stories are the most powerful tools we have uh, to make change in that way because it's about shifting mindset and that shifts action and film and TV is one of the most powerful ways of doing that. But the second thing that I'll say, and I'm not sure that I can say this in my good energy hat, so I'm gonna take that off, just say that in my Jess hat, is that like one of the most powerful stories of our time is labor organizing. And so yes. much of the climate crisis just comes down to the fact that capitalism, colonial capitalism in specific, um, extracts resources from the global south, from uh, marginalized communities across the world, both in LA and um, you know everywhere, really, at this disproportionate amount, and the climate just can't handle it because the earth is not designed for profit, it's designed for life. Yes. Um, and labor power, because this is, you know, the climate crisis is a crime of the ownership class, is the most important tool that we have to forge change as working class people, right? And so in Hollywood, you know, we have WGA. Ali was still on strike for a long time. <laughs> Love to see it. Uh, WGA just got their contract. All of us actors on SAG. I'm not SAG yet. I will be soon, as long as the strike is over. And soon, hopefully. So, like, I just ask all of you, one, support the strikes. And two, like, as you're going forward to tell stories, think about that labor aspect. Because it's, you know, the most, most powerful story of our time. And it's intimately tied to climate, the biggest story of our time, right? Um, so this is a long answer, but hope it but a good fun. answer. Yeah. Thank you so much for your insight on that. Could not yeah. have said it better. Thank you so much for that, Allie. Um, yes, Jess stole half of my usual answers to that question, um, but I wanted to add that they are totally right. That and back to kind of 
the last question you asked me about, you know, inclusion and diversity in Hollywood, it's like, we have so far to go. Um, and I always try, like one of my biggest things that I try to talk about is, you know, a lot of companies have formed DE&I initiatives or diversity, equity, inclusion initiatives, but they don't include climate. And that makes no sense to me. You already have all of these systems to put information about out there about other social justice movements. Um, so you should be including climate, both because it is already a system that you've created to funnel out that in similar information, but also because racial justice and climate justice are intricately intertwined. Um, you cannot talk about one without talking about the other. Um, and so to me, that would be a fantastic way to continue putting out that work both in storytelling, but that's also the thing that I talk about the most is climate is the most intersectional issue of our time. If you are, are fighting for any other issue that exists, it intersects with climate. And that's kind of exciting to me, even though it's challenging because it creates a million different entry points for anyone on earth to get involved in this movement. Um, and so that's especially when I was programming the climate summit this year, I was trying to create a lot of intertwined, but different topics for each conversation so that people could attend and really find the thing that they felt passionate about um, and then realize that climate is, doesn't have to be this huge, scary, inaccessible movement, um, that it can be these smaller moments of community building and connecting with someone and, and relating to their story, which is why the storytelling aspect is so important. Um, and ultimately, you know, we are a lot more likely to pass along an anecdote than potentially just a fact that someone has told us about something, which is not to say that facts are not incredibly important, but how can we take those facts and accurately represent them in a digestible and entertaining way so we can continue to tell those anecdotes of how climate is affecting all of us um, in positive and in negative ways. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> That's such a great answer. Thank you so much for that, Ali. And I love how you said there are multiple entry points, and that is meeting people where they are. Like you said, yes. any cause, there's going to be that intersection with climate change. And so um, we always like to say if you try to meet people, if you try to get people to meet you where you want them to be, you're going to set yourself up for a disappointment and failure. If you meet them where they are, that's when those conversations can happen and real change can take place. So thank you so much for that. All fantastic answers. I have one more question for you. You ready? Okay. Yeah. Um, so if you could give our audience one piece of advice um, or an actionable item for environmental storytelling or sustainable behind the scenes practices, what would it be? Sheila, would you like to go first? Sure. <laughs> um, my advice would be to know how much you matter and whether you're above the line, below the line, your voice matters. And uh, at habitsofvoice.org, we've provided a toolkit for anyone above the line or below the line, different ones, so that you can have the support of an organization behind you as you bring in this uh, campaign of Lights, Camera, Plastic, Climate Storytelling, any of it really, to those higher ups um, and know that th those little moments of pressure that they feel adds up. And if more and more people start saying, hey, what about, um, they'll start listening. Absolutely. Matter. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Sheila, for that fantastic answer. Jess? Yeah. Um, one of the first sort of myths that we like to bust at Good Energy, which we find gets in the way of people kind of like writer's block, is that you have to be an expert on climate to start telling climate stories. Like, I got a whole master's degree to learn that that was not the case. <laughs> um, <laughs> right? And so, yeah. Uh, Starting with the questions that you have and the experiences that you have, the way that climate has touched your life or your community, um, it's very likely that your audience members have the same questions and have similar experiences. So that is like, you know, write what you know, start where you are, meet people where they are, and you will already be telling compelling, impactful climate stories. And you want, if you want a little extra help, we have a whole community of people at Good Energy, at Habits of Waste, at the Hollywood Climate Summit, who would love to help you heighten that. Um, Thank you, and that's so important because it does get a little daunting when people start asking questions and you're not sure of the answer. You don't have to be an expert. Share your own climate story. Thank you so much. Allie. Whew, it is always hard being the last person to answer something because my advice would be relatively similar. Um, I think to Sheila's point, I always, you know, try to encourage people that, especially if you are in Hollywood at all, um, you know, Hollywood is, 
a very complicated hierarchical system of power, but you hold a lot of power by being in this space and you have a lot of ability to make change. And it's just about finding those other people around you who want to do the same thing. Um, you're going to be much stronger as a collective than as a single person. Um, and I definitely really encourage everyone to check out the resources that are already out there. There's so much. And we talk to people all the time that, you know, we didn't realize they already had a, a, a guidebook or, or a, a resource online or any of these things. Um, so, I mean, all of the work we do has resources on our websites uh, that lead you to more resources. But um, I really encourage everyone to just explore those passion points for them um, because there is something out there. There is an organization out there who is who is trying to do that work already and needs your support and enthusiasm. Like that is the biggest thing. And, you know, we run into that all the time with the summit of, you know, trying to get larger stakeholders and celebrity power to come on board to then uplift those grassroots activists and their messaging um you know and people panic and they're like well i'm not a climate expert i don't want to talk about this and we're always like we just need you to be excited we will put the expert on the stage with you we just need you to be excited to talk about it and you know and then they get very excited by that so it's like that's kind of the the thing that I think allows the rest of it to blossom is if you have that excitement and passion and then find the people to talk about it with and then tell stories about it. <laughs> Wonderful answer. Thank you all so much for that. And you're right because, you know, not everybody's going to be an expert, um, but having that excitement and a willingness to learn and to be open and communicative and um, listen to everybody else's stories and share your own. So thank you so much to our panelists here um, for joining us this evening and for sharing your incredible work and experiences. This has been so eye-opening and so inspiring, which is incredible because like you said, that excitement that can really get people moving and that's something that we really truly want to do with Better Earth Media. So one more thing, I know I said one last question last time, but this one is a lot easier to answer, I promise. And nobody can steal your answer. You'll hear why in just a, just a moment. <laughs> Please tell us how our audience can find you online and support you so that we can show our support to you and everything you're doing. Sheila, where can we find, or do you, do you want to start, Allie? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Hi, I'm Allie. You can find me on Instagram at the L, at the L word. It's like the L word with an A. Um, you can find the Hollywood Climate Summit at Hollywood Climate Summit on Instagram and LinkedIn and all the things. Um, and also at hollywoodclimatesummit.com. Um, yeah, and we are in the process of fundraising to turn into a full-fledged nonprofit. Um, so we are always looking to have conversations about that or any partnerships or sponsorships for next year's event. Um, and then, you know, now that the strike is over, I'll throw it out there that I'm on the hunt for a new writing job. So if you're in the need for a TV writer who also uh, is a climate storytelling expert, um, that that's who I am. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm going to steal Elise's format but not answer um yeah so uh i'm jess visconte you can find me on instagram at jess visconte um email is jess at goodenergystories.com good energy stories uh good energy is our website you can also find good energy story on instagram uh, and we would love to connect with you if you have a, a climate storytelling project that you're excited about and you want to collaborate on we'd love to talk about it um, and yeah, as soon as this strike is over, I'm a working actor, so let me know. <laughs> um, so we're at habitsofwaste.org. Our Instagram handle's a little funny. It's called How Changers, so Habits of Waste Changers. And um, hello at habitsofwaste.org. Just reach out. We always like talking to new people and we're really open. Yeah. Wonderful. So please go ahead and I'm going to ask our whole audience to find them on Instagram, LinkedIn, um, go to their websites, research, download their free tools that, that they have. Um, Sheila, I was going to ask too, um, will you have a way for us to support your new book when it comes out next year? Absolutely. Thank you for saying that. Uh, this is my first book, so I'm learning as mm -hmm. we go, but I think Earth Day, it's going to be out in all the bookstores, Amazon, everything. So stay tuned but if you follow you'll find out more because I'll probably know more than too <laughs> <laughs> as you know more will know more is yeah, that what you're saying exactly. okay fantastic well we will absolutely support you so um thank you so much um to our lovely panelists for being here this evening let's give them one more round of applause Woo!